I will I will check. You want me to go to print something? I can send I will no, send okay. you something to print. No, I you send directly right? to print it. No, no, uh, to my computer? I, I'll try. Okay. Very good. Very good. Après ça, euh, je pense qu'on peut commencer. Mais donc il n'y a, a, a que quatre membres du jury qui sont en visio, c'est ça Non, we, we need five. Non Moi j'attends cinq. Simone Lundi. Ah, Simone Lundi. And I've been missing. Ah, it's okay because uh, Marco Romoli, Marco Romoli, and Deltana, they are with Simone, I think so. Ah. Is it true? You're all there with Simone? He said yes. Uh, you, can, you can speak. You yes. can speak. I speak up, Simone. Sorry, sorry, I was muting the microphone. Yes, we are all together here. Uh, Marco Romoli, Duca Del Zanna, and me. Room. Uh -huh. Ok, bon, on a besoin de la fin, là, quoi, maintenant. Et du coup, je peux, je peux l'imprimer après ouais. Je vais le Il faut imprimer. Oui, euh... je vais jamais imprimer. Ok, bon, on va, on va commencer alors, hein, je pense. On est là, on peut commencer. C'est toi qui décides. Ok. Ok, so we begin. So, uh... I don't know if the rest of the jury can hear me. Yes. Yes. We welcome you. Yes. Away. <laughs> so we are going to listen to Laura Bercic's presentation about the radial evolution of solar wind electrons. So we hear you for around 45 minutes, and then we are going to ask questions. OK. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, so today I will be talking about my thesis project, uh, The Radial Evolution of Solar Wind Electrons, uh, which I did uh, in collaboration between the University of, of Florence and Lysia Obser Paris Observatory, under the supervision of Milan Maximovich, Simone Landi, Lorenzo Mattini, and Filippo Pantelini. Um, so the presentation is structured in this way. First, I will talk a bit about the background of the field. Um, what are the open questions? And then I will talk about how we approach these open questions. Um, the main part of the presentation are my results, which can be divided um, mainly in two parts, in observational part, where we present the anal data analysis of Helios and Parker Solar Probe data, and the numerical part, where we present the results of kinetic, BCOP kinetic model. In the end, um, I will talk about what you can conclude from our work and um, what is the future um, continuation of this topic. So let's start. First, I show two pictures of the sun, which are not actually the pictures of the solar surface, but of the solar corona, which is just above the solar surface. So the solar corona is made of plasma and strong magnetic fields, um, and it can be observed in two ways. So here on the left, we see a picture um, of emitted UV light taken with the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Um, and here in this picture, the color tells us the density of the plasma. So the dark regions are, um, have lower density and the bright regions, they're denser. We can already see like these more structures which tell us about the structure of magnetic field. On the right side, I show a picture taken during the solar eclipse from Earth. And here we can see corona which reflects white light from the sun. Um, here, because we, we see a bit more, we can see um, how the solar corona extends further away from the sun, and even better, this shape of magnetic field lines. So the solar corona is very hot. It reaches 1 million uh, degrees Kelvin. Uh, and because it's so hot, some, some particles can escape and form solar wind. The solar wind is made mostly of electrons and protons, which have opposite charges and different masses. Um, I, when the particles escape the sun, they pull the magnetic field with them, and they move radially, but the sun has some rotation. So these magnetic field lines 
form a spiral, which is called Parker spiral, spiral after Eugene Parker, who discovered the solar wind. Um, on the left side, I show some typical measurements taken in solar wind. Um, this is an example from Parker Solar Probe. So we see magnetic field in the top panel. Um, we can see that it's very variable. Then we see velocity in the next panel. So average velocity is around 400, 500 kilometers per second. Um, and we separate the solar wind into fast and slow solar wind. So here, the first interval, it's kind of fast solar wind and later it's slow solar wind. And uh, this velocity is also correlated with solar wind density. So the higher the velocity, the lower the density um, and the other way around. Um, so we said that electrons are much lighter than solar wind protons. And this means that if electrons and protons have the same temperature, their thermal velocity will be very different. Like you can see from equation, the mass is a part of this equation. Um, and it means that actually electrons will be much faster than protons. So if you now take an example of the corona at 1 million Kelvin, this means that the thermal speed of electrons will be 5,500 kilometers per second, but that of protons only 130 kilometers per second. Because the escape velocity of the sun is 600 kilometers per second, this means that almost all the electrons can escape while the protons cannot escape. Um, but all the plasma that escapes needs to be quasi-neutral, otherwise the sun would be charging. So this ambipolar electric field arises, which then accelerates the protons and decelerates the electrons. So ambipolar electric field is one of the most uh, important mechanism of solar wind acceleration. And in this thesis, we want to know exactly um, we, how big is the part that electrons contribute to this solar wind acceleration. <clears throat> so how do uh, solar wind electrons look like? Here is an example um, of measurement of electron velocity distribution function of Parker Solar Probe. So um, what we see, so electron velocity distribution function is three-dimensional and we can measure it at any point in space. So we have different representations of these functions. For example, here I chose to plot um, the cut parallel and perpendicular to magnetic field. So with blue triangles, you see the parallel cut and the red ones are the perpendicular cut. And we can see that depending on the orientation with magnetic field, the distribution function is different. We can also see that this is not a simple distribution function uh, with the Gaussian um, distribution like we would expect in the air at, um, in uh, gas in thermal equilibrium, but it has this energy, high energy tails. So because of these tails, we, mo we usually model the electron velocity distribution function with three components, which are already written here. So the densest part is called the, the core, and it's actually well represented by a Maxwellian. Maxwellian function is this fit found here. Um, we believe it's dominated by collisions. And then um, at higher energies, we have these high energy tails, which are, which are well represented by kappa distribution function, which looks like this. So uh, the property of a kappa are these non-thermal tails. Um, the third population, the stral, is special because it's focused around the magnetic field. Um, and it's moving away from the sun. So really the stral electrons are the fastest and they're moving away from the sun. Um, so this will be the first electrons that reach the instrument when we measure distribution functions. Um, there's two ways to um, model the solar wind, well, basically two ways. Um, one is fluid approach and one is kinetic approach. And because of the shape of this distribution function, um, we decided for a kinetic approach because uh, fluid assumes that there is a collisional dominated plasma. Um, and as we can see here, because of these features, this plasma is only weakly collisional. So we choose a kinetic approach, um, which is for the solar wind done with exoskeletal models. And this is a collisionless, uh, these are collisionless. Um, so what can we learn from the velocity distribution functions in the solar wind? Um, one thing we can do is measure these functions at different distances from the, sun, from the sun. For example, at 30 solar radii, as shown here for Piper Solar Probe, and at 125 solar radii. And we can follow how this distribution changes with radial distance. We are able to do this on the interval between uh, 30 solar radii and one, oh, even above one astronomical unit. But in this thesis, we focused on analyzing the data of two missions, which were um, spanning the distances within one astronomical unit. 
Um, and then, so we want to learn something also about the solar wind origin, about the conditions, um, the plasma status in the solar corona, where the solar wind comes from. And if we want to relate these, for example, the pictures that we saw before of the sun with the distribution functions measured in situ, we need to use models. And in our work, we use this kinetic model called BICOP. Um, so here I point out uh, three important questions that remain uh, in this field and the ones that we also try to address. So the first one is, um, what are the plasma conditions in the solar corona? So what can we say about the electron distribution function in the solar corona? What is the temperature of different populations? Um, then solar wind acceleration. So I already mentioned this ambipolar electric field. So how big of a part of the solar acceleration is actually provided by solar wind electrons? And the third one um, is which physical mechanisms have effect on electron distribution function with radial distance? So what is more important, the ambipolar electric field, column collisions, electromagnetic wave interactions, or turbulence? Um, now we'll talk about how we approach these problems. So we started with the simplest uh, model. So um, I mentioned before the three populations. In our thesis, we focused on the stral population. So this is the collisionless population, which is focusing around the magnetic field and is the first one to escape the sun. We focus on this population because we believe it can tell us something about the solar corona. Um, so if you look at this simple collisionless model, um, in exospheric models, we have exobase, um, and exobase is a distance at which plasma turns from collisional to collisionless. So if you look at the situation at the exobase, we kind of have um, uh, isotropic Maxwellian distribution function, and then the anti-sunward directed part can escape and focus around the magnetic field, um, uh, taking into account the energy and magnetic moment conservation. Um, in this model, there are two full parameters. One is the location of the exobase, and the second one is the jump in the electric potential. Um, so having this in mind, we uh, decided on two parameters, how to quantify the stral electrons. And now um, I will show how these parameters behave for the example of this simple model. So one of them is stral pitch angle width. So we want to know, so we quantify this popula the stral population, and we want to know what is the width at different energies? So we fit pitch angle distributions with the normal distribution function. We calculate the full width have maximum, and we obtain this width of the stral electrons. Mm. So if we now apply this simple model and look at how this stral distribution function looks like at 35 solar radii, um, this is what I show here. Uh, pitch angle width on the y-axis, on the x-axis is the electron energy, and these three different lines show um, the variation of the jump in the electric potential between, um, between the exobase and the 35 solar radii. So we see that this jump in the potential does not have an effect of, on pitch angle width. Then in the bottom plot, we, we um, vary the location of the exobase, and here we see that it's very important for the pitch angle width. So the higher the exobase, the broader the stral electrons. The second parameter, which will characterize the behavior along the magnetic field, um, is the stral parallel temperature. So which means we take the parallel cut th through the distribution function, we fit it with the Maxwellian, and then we look at the temperature. So I performed the same test as uh, for the pitch angle width. Now here we, we vary and the jumping potential, and in the bottom plot, we vary the exobase. Um, on this plot, we plot the logarithm of distribution function with respect to electron energy, and if this is a Maxwellian, we expect to see a straight line. And in fact, we see this is more or less a straight line. We can fit it, and the temperatures we obtain are always the same. So our conclusion here is that, according to the simple model, stral parallel temperature does not change from the solar corona to the observation point. Um, so then we wanted to analyze and find these parameters also from these different approaches. So to analyze the data, observational data, and to find pitch angle width and the stral parallel temperature, and to analyze the um, numerical results and to find these two parameters as well. 
So um, first I will present observational results. And so here we start with pitch angle width. These are the um, data analyzed from the Helios mission. Uh, the two plots show two different types of solar wind, low beta wind and high beta wind. Uh, beta parameter is written here as an equation, but actually it's a ratio between the thermal pressure and magnetic pressure. Um, these different lines, different colors mean different distances. So the brighter the color, the further away from the sun. And one thing that we notice already is that with a simple model, we were expecting focusing. So focusing with radial distance. And here we actually see broadening with radial distance in both cases. Um, this means that some scattering mechanism must exist and we can speculate which are these scattering mechanisms um, depending on the relation between, between pitch angle width and energy. So um, we believe that this low energy part can be scattered by column collisions, which has a decreasing trend as well. Then high energy part with an increasing trend, um, we believe is affected by turbulence, either through um, resonant interaction or stochastic heating. Um, and then the third thing that we notice is that high beta wind is much more scattered uh, than the low beta wind. Uh, and we believe the, the reason for this is just the high beta because high beta plasma is more unstable. Um, now we use the same data in a bit different representation to compare this data directly to the simple focusing model. So um, we have low beta wind on the top, high beta wind on the bottom. And uh, here is the closest distance measured, so at 0 0.34 astronomical unit. And then in green, we see the evolution of measurements. And in red, um, we just apply the, the simple model and see what we would expect to see from a simple model. So we see that this goes completely in the opposite way. Um, another thing we could do is try to extrapolate this data um, and see what would happen closer to the sun, for example, at 0 0.16 astronomical units. And this is 35 solar radii. We see that from the data, we predict that the stral will be more narrow than further from the sun. But with a simple model, of course, the result is the opposite. And I was lucky that this, during the course of my thesis, the Parker Solar Probe was launched, who actually went with the first two pure helium to this distance, 35 solar radii, and we could check how the pitch angle actually looks like there. And now this is the result from the Parker Solar Probe. Um, on left, we see the first encounter data. On the second, the second, on the right side, the second encounter data um, with different colors or different types of solar wind with respect to beta. Um, and what we can see on this plot is really that the stral was more narrow than what was observed by Helios. And we see that, again, we find this decreasing trend at low energies, which we believe is due to column collisions. But of course, this is now just an assumption um, because we will test it later with the, our model. Um, again, the high beta wind is more scattered even for higher energies. And we believe this is due to electromagnetic waves or turbulence. Now let's go to the second parameter, stral parallel temperature. So how does the stral behave along the magnetic field? Um, from a simple model, we were expecting that, that the stral parallel temperature will not change with radial distance. And now let's see what we found. Um, here I show two histograms. They are normalized for each column. Um, and on the left side, we compare the stral parallel temperature with the radial distance. And the right side compares the stral parallel temperature with um, the velocity of the solar wind. And what we see that, in fact, the stral parallel temperature does not vary with radial distance. And it's anti-correlated with the solar wind velocity. Um, so the solar wind velocity is usually used um, at to, because um, we know that fast solar wind originates from coronal coils and slow solar wind uh, originates from edges of coronal coils or more complicated magnetic structures. Um, so um, this anti-correlation with solar wind velocity is a sign that um, Stral can tell us something about the conditions in the solar corona. Um, this anti-correlation between temperature, so the total electron temperature and solar wind velocity was already found by Jasper Halikas and Milan Maksimovic, also with Parker Solar Probe data. Um, but what they found is that this correlation is getting weaker and weaker when we move away from the sun. But in our case, this shouldn't be the case because the temperature does not change with radial distance. So this correlation should be preserved also 
far away from the sun. Uh, now to be sure that um, actually these measurements can tell us something about the temperature of the corona, um, we verified this plot in two ways. One was to combine our measurements with the um, point field solar um, source surface model, which is shown in this plot. So um, in the back, we see the picture of the sun in UV. Again, the darker regions are the regions with lower density and the brighter regions with higher density. Um, this white line is the current sheet. Uh, and now this model, um, how they calculate this model is they use the magnetic picture of the sun. Uh, and then they, um, from the source surface, they uh, ballistically assume the movement of the solar wind to the spacecraft. And then um, these circles are the trajectory of the Parker Solar Probe spacecraft above the, above the solar surface. And then they connect it with magnetic lines to the footprints. So what we see in color are actually our measurements. So the black um, notes denotes um, low temperatures and the red at the higher temperatures. And what we can see here is that actually here when connectivity appears to be in this coronal hole, the temperatures are actually lower, while here close to the current sheet and a bit here as well, where the connectivity appears to be more to the edges of coronal holes, um, the temperature is higher. So this is one confirmation, again, that Stral can tell us something about the temperature of the coronal. The second verification was to do the same analysis on Helios data, because Helios data has a much larger database and um, it's for different kinds of solar wind and also over different distances. So we see that here even from 65 solar radii to 215 solar radii, which is one astronomical unit, um, Stral parallel temperature showed no clear trend of decreasing. Um, and also this anti-correlation was found with the solar wind velocity. So this is another proof that um, can actually say something about the corona from in situ measurements. Okay, so now I talked about the radial evolution of the Stral as observed with our spacecraft. So it's this part here. Um, and now we want to relate this observation using a model to the solar corona. So we go to numerical results. The model we used is called BCOP and it was developed by Simone Landi, Filippo Pantolini, and Filippo Pantolini. Um, it's a global model of the uh, radial expansion of the solar wind, uh, which includes binary Coulomb collisions between particles. As you can see here in the schematics, so it's one dimensional in uh, space. The velocities can have three dimensions. Um, there is the gravity of the sun. And now because of the difference of the mass of electrons and protons, we get this antipolar electric field, which is pointing also along this one dimension. And we have two boundaries, bottom boundary and top boundary, where we have to um, define boundary parameters like distribution functions. Um, and of course, yeah, we have these collisions which uh, happen with a probability um, set for Coulomb collisions. So it decreases with velocity to the power of four and radial, radial distance to the power of two. Mm, so our simulation runs. Um, BCOP simulation has already been used um, in two ways. One of them is really studying the um, radial distance above the sun, but the mass ratio between electron and proton, this was in 2001 and 2003, was not the real one. Um, and the second time there were, this simulation was used um, was for the distances further from the, further from the sun where um, the gravity is not so important. So what we do here is we have the real ratio and we investigate the acceleration region, so region close to the sun. Um, we have four simulation runs here. Um, run A is a long run, so it's starting from the solar surface at one solar radii. Um, we put it at a temperature of two million Kelvin, the same for protons and electrons, and with velocities is zero. Now we find out, if you look at this plot, that in fact, only due to this um, acceleration from the solar wind electrons, we obtain velocities above 200 kilometers per second. This means um, supersonic uh, solar wind protons. But in fact, these velocities are not 400 or more as expected in solar wind. So from here, uh, we can say that electrons are not the only mechanism which accelerates the solar wind, but they have a great contribution to it. 
Um, then we did three simulations, which start at um, radial distance, three solar radii, because we wanted to avoid this uh, strong gradient in the bottom to have better sensitivity of simulation all along the run. So we designed these three simulations so that the velocity profile match with the first one. Um, and then we, uh, we designed three different collisionalities. So the green is the lowest collisionality, the yellow is medium, and um, blue is high collisionality. And we see that uh, collisionality does not have an effect on the final velocity, or not at least a strong one. But you can see that the um, temperature evolution is very different for the three simulation runs. So now what we wanted to do is take the distribution function from, the solar, from this uh, big of model and compare it to the numerical, uh, to, the, um, to the models already existing for the solar wind. So um, in exospheric models, escaping particles and uh, particles which not, do not escape can be separated by this velocity. So it means that at every radial distance, um, electrons which have velocity which is above the potential energy at this point will be able to escape and form the strike population. And every, um, all the electrons with the velocity below this will start falling back towards the sun. Um, this means that uh, all these velocities will be copied on the other side, but above this line, above um, the, this V5, there will be no electrons on the sunward side. This is why this velocity is called the cutoff velocity. Um, yeah, and we will compare it with our big up results. And then the second one is a steady electron runaway model developed by Scudder, um, where he uses the dry solar electric field. Uh, dry solar electric field is a measure of, a collisionality, uh, of uh, the size of electric field compared to the collisionality of the system. So uh, one, this dry solar unit is um, the electric field needed to accelerate uh, a part, an electron for one thermal velocity in one minute path. We can use this dry cell electric field to obtain the separation velocity, the dry cell velocity, which is written here. And this velocity will separate the distribution function um, to the overdumped region. So this is the blue region and is dominated by column collisions. Um, we expect that this will be a Maxwellian, of course, and um, all these regions above and below, the dry cell velocity are underdumped, um, which means that non-Maxwellian features are expected. Now let's see how these velocities, so we can calculate these velocities from, with the data from the simulation. And now let's see how they compare to the, to the distribution functions obtained. These three distribution functions are from the high collisional, medium collisional, and low collisional run. And we can see that um, first this V5 derived from exospheric models um, really represents the electron cutoff velocity. So there's no electrons above this line. And the dry cell velocity really represents the velocity where the strial starts to form. We can see that um, this exospheric velocity is more or less the same in all three simulation runs, but the dry cell velocity varies, so it becomes smaller and smaller as the collisionality is decreased. And you can see here really the dry cell velocity is very small, but the strial electrons, they start already also at very small velocity. We can look at the distribution functions in a different way. Um, and here I show one distribution function from the medium collisionality run, um, where gyrotropy is assumed. So everything along this direction is V parallel and along this direction is V perpendicular. Um, and we plot again these two velocities as circles in this plot. Um, this is the original distribution function in logarithmic scale. The middle one is the scaled distribution where we normalize each energy bin to itself so that the, um, to the values between zero and one. So we will really see for each energy um, if there exist any small features. And here we can see that the strial starts exactly above this um, dashed line, which represents the dry cell velocity. And the third representation is normalized representation where we normalize the distribution to the value set perpendicular velocity. So here we only have white colors, but if we have an over density with com um, compared to the perpendicular value, we will get red values. And if we have an under density, blue values. And here we can very nicely see that um, also this blue line um, 
is positioned just uh, next to the under, under density. So this is the cutoff velocity. We're interested um, in the radial evolution of this function. So what we can do with these um, representations is just take the parallel cut and plot it with respect to radial distance. This is what we see here. So each, each of these bins is one distribution function. Um, this kind of plot lets us to compare this uh, dry cell velocity and the exponential velocity over the whole simulation domain. So from three solar radii to 49 solar radii. Um, we can see that this dashed line follows here the transition between blue and red, and this blue line follows the really this um, under density on the bottom. The next thing we did is we took this model spinal electrons and calculated the pitch angle width of these three simulations at 35 solar radi radii. In this plot, I compared the Bicop results with the simple model in dashed lines and with the particle solar probe data, which is um, here where we have the error bar. So the first thing we can see is this discrepancy between the simple model starting from three solar radii. So the simulation also starts from three solar radii, that's why we compare it. Um, but we see that these two do not exactly match. We believe that this is a consequence of a um, multi-exobase phenomena. So in simple model, we have single exobase, which means at one radial distance, um, the plasma goes from collisional to collisionless. But in nature, this happens, this transition is smooth. So in the simulation, we can capture that because we don't have to define the exobase. And we believe that this distance in pitch angle width is due to this phenomena. Um, now, if we just compare the three simulation runs, we see that um, they have different shapes, but for the higher energies, all the pitch angles width match. So from here, we can conclude that column collisions can affect only energies below 250 electron volts, which I mark here with dashed line. And above it, the stride is completely collisionless. Um, we see that the particle solar probe data so the shape of the pitch angle width with respect to energy matches the best, the blue line, so the high collision run. So we can say that actually the pitch angle width observed, this is only the case of low beta um, with particle solar probe. The width of the strike can be explained only with column collisions. Um, there is still some discrepancy between particle solar probe data and the model. And we, um, we believe that this could come either from the fact that particle spiral is not included in the model, we just have the radial magnetic field, or some measurement limitation, for example, because you are sampling data for 16 seconds and during this, uh, the magnetic field is varying, so we could be measuring stral wider than it actually is. Okay, um, now we go to stral parallel temperature. Um, on the left plot, I show the parallel cuts to the distribution function, normalized, um, to the parallel cut through the distribution function at the bottom boundary. So with this plot, we want to see um, how the distribution function evolved with radial distance compared to how it was in the beginning. So if it was exactly the same as in the beginning, so if the temperature was the same, we would get a flat line. So this, this is what happens here for the first step. Um, if we find any decrease, and decreasing lines, this will mean that the temperature is lower than in the beginning. And if we find an increase, means that it means that the temperature is higher than in the beginning. And surprisingly, so from the observations, we believe that the stral parallel temperature does not vary with radial distance. But what we figure out from big up simulations is that actually it's increasing. So this red line has a bit of slope. So it means that the temperature is a bit higher than it was in the beginning. Mm, we quantify this increase in temperatures by fitting the strand for the three different simulation runs. And th this is what is shown on this plot. Um, so we can see that depending on the collisionality, this increase in temperature is different. The highest increase we see for the high collisional run and the lowest increase for the low collisional run. Um, because so this, from here we know that it's collisions that are doing this increase in strike parallel temperature. So we propose um, an idea for a mechanism um, which could scatter, uh, yeah, which could uh, increase this parallel temperature of the strike. So um, in this representation, where we take the logarithm of distribution function. So again, we expect to have straight lines for Maxwellians. 
So here we have the electron core, and this is the strand. So it's a straight line, it's a Maxwellian with some temperature. And then um, if we add collisions, so collisions will only affect the portion of the strand close to the core, which is a bit denser than at higher energies. Um, it will change the slope of this uh, parallel cut to a temperature which is actually smaller than it was before. But if we then combine and fit all these parts together, we will get the green line, which is actually less steep than the yellow line here, which means that the new temperature is higher. Um, here is just a schematic. So we, I believe that this is happening um, continuously with radial distance and uh, for different energies. So close to the sun, this happens at high energies. Far, far from the sun, this will happen at lower energies. Um, but yeah, for now, this is just an idea. We haven't further developed this model. So we have to come to the end, to the end now. Um, I will uh, do some conclusions on what, uh, what we figured out during these two years. So at the beginning of my thesis, the strand was um, analyzed only above one astronomical unit, or the statistical study of the strand was only done above one astronomical unit. Um, the pitch angle width was already calculated by these two um, authors, and the strand parallel temperature was measured only at one astronomical distance by these two authors. So our contribution was to analyze the data within um, one AU, so in our heliosphere. Uh, we analyzed the data of Helios and Parker Solar Probe. In the thesis, we just included the encounter one and two. Um, and then we related these observations closer, closest to the sun to the, the, um, to the corona using BPOP model. Um, so in principle, we had three different approaches, simple model, BCOP, and observations. And if we look at the mechanisms which are included in these um, three options, we see that, okay, focusing is everywhere. Uh, then the difference between simple model and the big model um, is the tra transition from collisional to collisionless plasma. Um, we could study well column collisions because they were included, included in our model. And of course, we believe that column collisions also affect the observations. And then uh, here I have four phenomena, which we have not studied in detail. Um, and we believe that if there is a difference between observations and the simulation, will, it will be due to this phenomena. So what we learned about the gradi uh, gradual transition from, from collisional to collisionless plasma is that it's important for the evolution of pitch angle width, but it's not important for the evolution of strike parallel temperature because the strike parallel temperature does not depend on the choice of the exodase. Um, then column collisions with simulation, we determined that at 35 solar radii, collisions can scatter strial just below 250 electron volts. Um, we found that dependence between electron energy, um, uh, between pitch angle width and electron energy for a special type of wind can be explained just by column collisions. Um, then for the strial parallel temperature, we got this surprising, surprising result that the strial power temperature increases up to 15% in the simulations. Um, so our first conclusion, which was that the strial actually tells us the temperature of corona is not exactly true. It tells us something about corona, but this temperature that we measure is actually overestimated up to 15%. Um, another interesting thing is to compare this BCOP with the exospheric model and runaway model. Um, and yeah, using this comparison, we can now use observational data and calculate some parameters. I, I will talk about this also a bit later. Okay, so natural uh, future plans from this work would be um, in BCOP. So now we tested the Maxwellian case. All these plots that I showed were for Maxwellian like cor corona. And in the manuscript, we also included the kappa like corona. Uh, but interesting thing would be also to have different temperatures of electrons and protons in the corona, or to have um, some other distribution functions, for example, uh, two different Maxwellians, like uh, what was suggested by the latest results of remote sensing. Um, then from observations, um, since the solar orbiter and now um, the Parker Solar Probe and now also the solar orbiter are still uh, in the beginning of their mission, it will be very important to use the tools that we develop also in the future. Um, we can use this Dreiser velocity, and this is what I started to say before, um, 
we can use it. So from observations, we can find this rise of velocity and we can use it to calculate the ambipolar electric field in the solar wind, uh, which, have, which was never until now measured in situ. Um, then of course, these new missions, they allow us to have high cadence velocity distribution functions and electric and magnetic field measurements. Um, and because of this high cadence, high resolution, we, we will be able to better understand the kinetics of wave particle interactions. Um, and another very important uh, thing is that actually now from the particle solar probe, very close to the sun, we don't have uh, the information how does the electron distribution function looks like above one kilo electron volt. But this measurement is very important um, because, for example, the presence of high energy tails uh, in this range would mean uh, something about the, the shape of the distribution function in the solar corona. Um, then if there, is, if there exists some features, um, they could make the distribution function unstable and they could lead to, to some instabilities and produce, for example, Whistler waves, which were observed, but um, they don't know what is the source of the Whistler waves yet. Um, and another thing which I haven't talked about so much during the talk is the um, existence of the halo population. So um, people found that uh, the density of the halo population is increasing with radial distance. So we believe that it's uh, the, the scattered electrons from the stral um, form the halo. So it will be very important to observe also the, these high energies, high energy tails to be able to tell something about the mechanism producing the halo. Um, yeah, so these are now, um, in the future, we will have a really good opportunity to study the solar wind and the inner, um, in our heliosphere solar wind, because the Parker Solar Probe will end up at 10 solar radii, I think next year already, and the solar orbiter will uh, change its orbit to study the um, polar, uh, the poles of the sun, and will reach the 0 0.3 astronomical unit. This, this is it. So we move to the questions. So can you hear me? Far away? Yes, yes. 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 Okay. okay. So uh, we will first uh, listen to the questions of the referees. Uh, and first, uh, Hayong She. Oh, you hear yes. us? Hello? Uh, wait, there, there, um, no, no, no. Yes, I'm here. The song accepted. Okay. 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 Uh, first, I want to say you have done a great work. Um. Thank you. My question, I have a question. When I read your thesis and your papers, I have a little bit of concern because when we do the observations, um, we want to be independent of the models, but, uh, but we also couldn't completely 100% get free from the models. So it means uh, observation interpretation and sometimes what we, we see in the observation greatly restricted by our models. So I wonder if you have any plans that you may want to do the observations in the future that may explore the observations in a more unified model. For example, if you study the straw, it's impossible for you to ignore the halo. And uh, when the 
solving the public gate in the space, and when we consider the energy conservation, we have to consider the whole um, electrons. Mm -hmm. um, so you're talking about the model consisting of core and halo and strali electrons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, in principle, it would be better to have one complete distribution function that matches all. But for now, I haven't seen this, unless you make a function just uh, summing up the Maxwellian plus Kappa plus another Maxwellian. Um, but I think you need this, as you see from this observation, um, it's not a uniform distribution function. I cannot imagine a function which will just fit um, this observation. Let me just... Um, yeah, but so for me, because there's a core and there's a halo, there needs to be two components because it feels like there is a sharp transition um, between the core and the halo. But I think there's still a big question in how you model the halo and how you model the strata electrons, um, which are sometimes better represented by kappa and sometimes better represented by um, uh, Maxwellian distribution function. And also what I've been studying now, um, are these uh, distribution functions uh, taken by Parker Solar Probe? Because with the new instruments, we get higher accuracy. And what it looks like is that even here on the top of um, in the core, the distribution is not exactly Maxwellian. So there is some departure from Maxwellian. Um, and I know that uh, some work was done with self similar distribution functions to fit the electron core. Um, so, yes, I will try to fit different functions, but I do not for now see how I can have one uniform function to represent um, the observation. But I do agree it's important for stability, um, for the conservation of energy. Yeah. Um, it, because I don't know the observation very well, how <laughs> the instrumentation effects. Uh, to my knowledge, the observation of the core should uh, be the most accurate part, right? Um, yeah, so the energy bins are the closest for the um, core measurement, but um, there's always a problem of secondary electrons which pollute the lowest electron energies. So in fact, the accuracy is very strong here, but there is always a hole in the middle, which is by secondary electrons. I see. Um, I see. Uh, yes, this is my, my only question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You don't have any other question? Okay, so we move to Christian Vox. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, wonderful. So first, uh, thank you for this very nice presentation. It was very interesting and very good presentation combining most recent observations with uh, some theoretical models. So now I have to come up with some questions. So mm -hmm. I found it quite interesting that you can actually probe solar coronal temperatures by measuring the strahl parallel temperature. And I have one question based on that. So you mentioned that uh, you can fit the strahl very well with Max Merlians, better than with Kappa distributions, uh, like you've done in your thesis. Mm -hmm. But the uh, halo is most, you can better fit it by Kappa distribution. And if you move away from the sun, you expect uh, strahl electrons to be scattered into the halo through some pitch angle scattering uh, mechanism. So can you achieve both? So getting this Maxwellian strahl and the Kappa halo without some mechanism that also accelerates or somehow provides energy to the electrons in the scattering process? Um, yeah, this is a very interesting point. I was also thinking a lot about it. So far from the sun, the, the halo and the strahl looks more kappa-like than close to the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, the reasons for this could be two. So when you measure the electrons closer to the sun, the core temperature, they become bigger. So actually, um, if you just take the relative uh, velocity compared to the thermal velocity, you're sampling a smaller portion of the halo. So far from the sun, for the velocity, for example, 15 uh, times 10, 10 to the 4 kilometers per second um, will be much higher compared to the thermal energy of the distribution than close to the sun. 
So it could be close to the sun distributions look more Maxwellian. Um, so the, it's, it's true for the strand and also for the halo. But it could be that we're just not seeing these high energy tails because we're not sampling energies above this value. Uh, this is just from the measurement perspective. But uh, for now, I do not, I think, as you said, to form a kappa function from a Maxwellian function, you would need a mechanism which also accelerates the particles, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, okay. So will solar orbiter provide uh, better data in this KAV electron range than Parker does? Um, it's not so clear for now yet, and I also myself haven't uh, looked at the distribution function, functions yet. But also for the Parker solar probe, it's not um, completely over yet because so the spacecraft is approaching the sun and the densities are becoming higher and higher. So in fact, they can sample higher energies. It's just that the, um, the flux is not big enough to detect it with enough accuracy. So maybe as the Parker solar approach, uh, probe approaches the sun, we will see these tails more accurately. Um, there, there, you also have. Um, there could, there should be also some instrument settings which would provide for these measurements. Uh, and I will, yeah, I have to talk to them and ask them to. I think it's a very important measurement to take. Okay, so if you go to slide number twenty, yes, is uh, the left plot the. Uh, uh, Core parallel the stral parallel temperature over solar distance. Um, plot, um, I see a lot of structure, wavy structure. Is it just the effect that solar distance for Parker Solar Probe also means uh, temperature over time, as Parker is just moving along its orbit? So you are probing different solar wind, fast solar wind, so solar wind, or is it something else? You can see a lot of wavy structure here. Yeah, exactly. I think it's just because in this plot, uh, there are data from two orbits. Mm -hmm. So um, it really ref reflects the properties of the solar wind that were there just when the Parker Solar Probe was passing it. Here in Helios, you see less of this because we actually, this is an average of uh, six years of data. So these uh, features kind of sort out, but Parker Solar Probe, there's not so much data. So you can actually see the, yeah, it's local variability in the solar wind. Um, so if you're, you mentioned your uh, Bicorp simulations on page 26. Um, you mentioned that you started your first simulation run with a velocity zero at the bottom boundary. I guess that refers to the inflowing part of the distribution function. Yes. So, yeah, so for a kinetic model that should work, but yeah, for a fluid model, of course, it could mean that you're somewhat, uh, you have an outflowing boundary at the top, uh, no net influx expected that you have some depletion or otherwise effects uh, in your simulation box. So does setting this velocity to zero, like shifting the core distribution or something have and provide some artifacts in the simulations? Um, I didn't completely understand the question, what kind of artifact would you expect? Um, yes, so if the inflowing bound velocity is zero, yes. would, of course, and you have a non-zero velocity higher up in the simulation box, you would, of course, um, expect that particles over time are leaving the simulation box. Um, yeah, so I think I know what you mean, but tell me if I'm wrong. Um, we also have to define the distribution. Um, we define the distribution uh, velocity distribution function at the bottom. Mm -hmm. These electrons then focus and through the ambiporal field accelerate the protons. And then on the top, the protons are supersonic, so it means that all the protons are, are escaping, but electrons they are still subsonic. So we have to define the distribution function also at the top boundary, because part of the distribution function is also coming back in to the simulation. Mm -hmm. And really, the um, by definition of this upper boundary of the uh, by definition of this shape of the distribution function at the upper boundary, um, I think you. I mean, it has to be defined so that you get the solar wind, which, which has a stationary solution. I think this artifact will be, um, it's provided for, for by defining this upper boundary distribution function. 
Did this answer the question? Mm -hmm. Yes, something, yeah. So if, yeah, if I expect only a small effect here anyway, I don't think it's a really critical thing. Um, yes. Uh, so some last thing that might be a bit hard to understand for the audience. It was rather quick and I think it's also complicated if you go to page 29. Uh, on back exactly the concept of the scaled and normalized uh, representation of the distributions. Can you somewhat more explain what the difference between these two is? So the scale distribution function, you really scale each energy bin to values between zero and one. This means that no matter what happens in other radial bins, we will see where is the most flux, so in red, in each energy bin. Um, and this will really show the smallest structures, but which sometimes are maybe not so important because you can see here in the core ratio where you don't have really one dominant population, you have something very isotropic, but you still see some features because um, some of the values will be scaled to one and some of the values will be scaled to zero. While in this normalized representation, you normalize everything with the perpendicular value. And this way you still keep the information um, about the evolution with energy. So basically in this normalized representation, you only compare how different is the parallel direction from the perpendicular one. And really in the scale distribution, you see the shape of the features. It's really to find the small features. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we now uh, listen to uh, Marco Romoli. Marco, do you hear us? Yes, I was uh, muted. So I have just uh, one question. It's a, it's a nice work. I learned a lot of things. I, I, I work more on spectroscopy on the lower corona. So this <laughs> is something new for me. Um, I have a question regarding the, um, the instruments. So it, you show the PSP data up to about 60 solar radii. Yes. Aren't there more data above that, uh, that uh, distance? Um, yeah, so um, this period is called an encounter period. And during this period, the instruments are set to higher cadence. And when you are out of this uh, 60 solar radii for the first orbits, the instruments have much lower cadence. And for example, electron distribution functions, they are integrated over large periods of time. I see. And, so you mix yeah. up uh, everything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think they're also good, and I use them for some analysis as well. But um, usually, I don't put them on the same plot because the results are a bit uh, still different. Yeah. And the other question is regarding the solar orbital instrumentation. So that there is a gap of 40 years, almost 40 years between Helios and the solar orbiter. So can you tell me what, I, I, I think the, the solar orbiter instrument is much, much better than the Helios one, but in, in what uh, they differ? Exactly. So electron distribution functions on Helios, they were measured only in two dimensions. So basically, the instrument looked like um, one, uh, one opening, which used the spin of the spacecraft to sample two-dimensional distribution function. Yeah. While on the Parker Solar Probe and on the Solar Orbiter, you have two instruments which sample three dimensions. So basically, you covered all, almost all the three-dimensional space. And another benefit is also that the cadence is much larger. So basically, for both instruments, in one millisecond, um, you can measure the whole distribution function, while from the Helios was uh, required to be 32 seconds or something like this, because the sensitivity of the instrument was much smaller. OK. And then for a solar orbiter, you will have the advantage of going away from the ecliptic. So we'll, you will have the chance to, to, to sample more um, high-speed uh, wind, I, I guess. Yes, exactly. I'm looking forward to this. Okay, yeah, that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you. 
And then uh, Luca Deltana. Hello, ciao Laura. Uh, great job, first of all. And well, since I'm a theorist, I will ask something about maybe the code. A numerical question. Uh, you are evolving also protons, right? Not only electrons, it's self consistent. Mm -hmm. What's the mass ratio? Because it's not mentioned in the, in the talk. Uh, the mass ratio is the real mass ratio in this simulation. There is one. Okay, okay. So mm -hmm. I can ask a question about convergence because it's already the real one. <laughs> <laughs> So the next curiosity is just about the magnetic field. Of course, these holes, for example, this equation, apart there are some mistakes, but not problem, uh, holds only for a radial magnetic field that behaves like one over R square, right? The exactly, yeah. usual one. Yeah. Uh, but is it possible to modify and to add an extra force in cases where you have, say, a super radial expansion, just to model a coronal hole in the vicinity, maybe, of the, of the surface. I know that the surface is already a bit tricky because everything is steep there, but maybe dividing in two simulations, the first part can be done with something like that. There must be a way to include this. So, how to include super expansion into big is the question. Yeah, because the Lorentz force, Lorentz force is not zero along the radius when you have something which yeah. is not completely radial. Uh -huh. Probably yeah. need some trick to include that. Um, for now, I I don't think of the way to including it. Um, actually, this because it's one-dimensional simulation. Also, it's really dependent on these tricks. Um, to have mm. everything along one dimension, so I'm not sure right now how how I would include this. Maybe for the future, there must be a way, I think, to remain in one dimension, but to, to add this extra focusing, say, due to, well, focusing, if you, if, no, the opposite, expansion, kind of, maybe, yeah, the opposite. Yeah. Something that goes in the V perpendicular somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay, but... Thanks. Thank you for the question. Other question? Uh, okay. So we now move to the supervisors. Ah, no, I, I, I forgot. François. <laughs> Le Président Paul. François. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, um, I'd like to join the, the rest of the jury to go uh, to it. It was a very nice presentation and I learned a lot. I have, um, I'd like to, to ask you two questions, if I, I can. Uh, one is related to your uh, slide 33, uh, if you don't mind to move to that one. Uh, yes, to this explanation. So, uh, from this plot, can we, can we, I mean, know, knowing that uh, uh, you seem to favor all the collisions, so can we, I mean, can we say that the, the closer you go to the, to the, to the solar corona, the higher stride you would expect? I mean, the, and, and also the, you, you would expect a stride which is far from a natural distribution when you move close to the sun. Will you, I mean, based on this uh, <coughs> diagram, will you conclude in that way? Um, so maybe if you look at here, you see um, in the first bin, so the stral starts to form. It's quite, a, um, it's not so defined as at the end. And I think that, um, so these schematics, for example, this point, what did I put? So this blue region close to the sun, it's at energy of uh, 20,000 kilometers per second. And this will happen, this phenomena will happen for these energies and it will be a bit transformed and then lower energies will, will transform with radial distance. But I would say that it, so the closest to the sun, the more Maxwellian or the more corona-like will be the stral. Uh, okay, but, but if you had collisions, you seem to suggest that you would expect some uh, ah, okay. change of slope in your, in your, in your uh, 
I understand now the question. Um, so for now, I haven't uh, gone so far to see if this would actually result again in a Maxwellian function due to the the system. The system behaves this way. Um, it was really just an idea which we developed in the last month. So. Um, so, so my following question was that uh, considering that uh, Parker's solar probe uh, um, so essentially so some low solar wind, uh, low solar wind velocity, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, what would you expect? I mean, still regarding this trial shape, I mean, uh, the fact that uh, according to Parker's solar probe, the shapes it be much mm -hmm. <coughs> would you expect for high speed solar wind? Uh, Something different, or something also more Maxwellian, or less Maxwellian distribution for this uh, type of wind. In fact, at the same distance, I would expect more Maxwellian because it came. If if I believe that the corona is Maxwellian-like, I would expect that this function is more similar to what happens um, because it it is faster in the solar wind. The electric field is stronger, so it reaches the instrument faster. Okay. And it's not transformed in by collisions, by waves, by... <coughs> I understand your point. <coughs> so my, my, my second question was regarding your discussion regarding the, the parallel temperature of the strat. I mean, uh, you, you, from the observation, you, you concluded that the, the, the this, uh, temperature does not change with radial distance. <coughs> Whereas in the, in, the, in the case of the simulation, you conclude that it should increase. Mm -hmm. And uh, your, your way to interpret this, uh, this discrepancy between simulation and observation, if I'm correct, uh, correctly understand your point, is that you might uh, simply uh, have, uh, underestimate the, the temperature in the, in the corona. That the total, mm -hmm. uh, the total temperature of the electrons might be underestimated. <clears throat> what I'm not sure to understand is that uh, because collisions exist, as you stated, Clearly, so you should expect an increase. So basically, can we not think that there is some mechanisms that uh, simply compensate somehow the, the increase of the temp parallel temperature? So in other way, <coughs> can, could we think that this uh, apparent uh, constant uh, evolution of the of the of this slack evolution of the temp parallel temperature of the strike is simply a product of two uh, two opposite mechanisms? Uh, would you think uh, do you agree um, the possibility? Uh, I, I see what you mean. And I think, so we see that the radial evolution by observation is constant from 0 0.3 to one astronomical unit, let's say. Um, and really in the simulation, I'm simulating the acceleration region and where the, the densities are much higher. So um, I think that, so this mechanism would have to be present from uh, the sun to approximately 20 solar radii. Yeah, I, I, would, I would think so, yeah. But okay. I mean, because... Okay. But then this mechanism disappears from 20 solar radii or... Because the, there's no more collisions, no? It seems that... So yeah, because, just, yeah, because you have three, I mean, yeah, this curves. You seem to see that when there is low collisions, the increase is very small, no? I mean, <clears throat> so... You would expect to change of the temperature flows when there is collisions, and less change when there is less collisions. No. Yes, but I say that collisions increase the temperature, and what yes. would be the mechanism? So it means close to the sun, you would expect an increase of the temperature. No. Yes. According to this simulation. Yeah, yeah. So on, if it's I mean, if the absorption, the absorption seems to, to say the contrary. So I'm saying that you, sh you probably there is a mechanism which simply. Uh, make the apparent temperature of the strike not increasing, no? Yeah, I, it could be this way. Um, but what I wanted to say is just that uh, we don't have observations of this region, in fact, yet. And it seems like, okay, here it's an increase and then it's kind of stabilizing. So, so it could be that we're just okay. observing this okay. part, which is so already stable. But it could be also that there is a second mechanism. I think uh, a lot will be shown when the Parker Solar Probe really goes to 10 solar radii, and then we will have a point that really in the acceleration region. Thank you. No, thank you for the question. So I have a question to you. Is Catherine Kraft connected? Yes, yes, I am connected. Okay, so if you Do have you a question. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, I have a question. Uh, this question is uh, connected uh, in, in, in some sense with the previous questions. 
but I don't want to discuss on the basis of the model. But uh, the result that the parallel temperature of the stral uh, does not vary with radial distance was not really expected uh, if we take into account previous observations near one AU. So um, does it mean really that uh, we cannot imagine that any scattering process involving electromagnetic waves or wave turbulence can modify this temperature? Um, yeah, of course, any interaction with electromagnetic waves and turbulence would be energy dependent. And also when we move away from the sun, the stral was observed to be more kappa-like, so it's changing the shape. But in our work, we chose the energy range, which looked Maxwellian, and we took the temperature from this energy range. Um, I think it's very important which techniques you use to calculate this parallel temperature, because in previous studies from 1AU, they were using a drifting Maxwellian or a drifting kappa function, whereas I use non-drifting Maxwellian, because this is kind of what we expect from exospheric model. Um, yeah, so even at 1 AU with Helios data, I obtain still the same temperatures the way I calculated them. Okay. Uh, <coughs> I have a question. Oh, sorry. So, so sorry. And, Catherine? And, yes, can I ask another? Yes, yes. Yes. Uh, as I understand, uh, for the moment, uh, you did not have until time to study simultaneous wave spectra observed uh, with the distribution function. So, oh, yeah. uh, yes, so, yeah. <laughs> yes, but I have a question about this, but what can you expect as possible wave particle process and uh, turbulence process? Uh, and what kind of turbulence process can be involved uh, <laughs> with uh, the Strahd's electron? Um, yeah, so from wave particle interactions, uh, really the most discussed interaction is between a parallel Wister wave, um, so resonant interaction with parallel Wister waves. Um, this study, there were a lot of studies of Wister waves already. There was a study comparing the stral and the Wister waves, and in some studies they find also broadening of the stral energy dependent um, corresponding to resonant velocity of these Wister waves. Um, now we move, so there are also other types of waves and there are two waves, two ways um, of scattering the stral um, um, with electromagnetic waves. One is that the wave already exists and then um, resonant interaction, resonantly interacts with electrons. And the second one is that actually distribution becomes unstable. It produces the waves and by producing the waves, um, it loses energy and the stral becomes more isotropic or more scattered. Uh, and from the turbulence part, there were two, two assumptions that I could find in the literature. So one is um, inter so interaction with the waves which are hidden in turbulent spectra. So below the spectra, there could exist some parallel with the waves, maybe only 1% or um, something like this. And they, if they would be at different, um, uh, so broadband waves, so at different frequencies, um, it means that the higher frequencies have lower um, spectra, so have less power in the spectra, and these frequencies would scatter lower energies, but um, at smaller frequencies where the power is higher, this, um, these waves would scatter higher energies, and this is why we expect a positive correlation between pitch angle width um, and electron energy. Uh, this is one thing, and the second one uh, is if the fluctuations of the magnetic field are on the order of the gyro radii of electrons, they could modify the trajectories and um, effectively scatter uh, the stral in the process of stochastic heating. But also for this theory, I haven't found, so there's a theory like this for protons, but I haven't found a paper for electrons. My next step uh, in this would be to check the stability of the distribution functions that we see in the presence of Wister waves. Ah, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. So I'll now move to the supervisors. So Simone Landi.
Hello. No, I just did the mic. No, I just, uh, no, it's not a real question in the sense that I know very well, I guess, the work done by by Laura, she was a great worker, so I not, have not really questions about uh, what she had done. Just uh, looking at the presentation, uh, I was wondering that we, if she had never did uh, an histogram about the, the core electron temperature as a function of... Uh, of uh, of the distance uh, like uh, for the stral for example i don't know if we already done that uh, or we have a, or you have I checked this if you have if you have some kind of different behavior depending on the velocity especially on the velocity of the of the solar wind uh yes yeah, so it's also in the thesis document this plot um but you mean radial evolution of core temperature or the radial, the radial evolution of the core temperature yeah, should be... Yes, yes. Um, we have this, it's in the thesis, but basically ah. the conclusion is that um, slower solar wind has higher gradients in temperature over and, radio and, and another point we have discussed, maybe we can uh, probably, in, in some sense, uh, even with the, the exospheric models and also with the with the simulation, we we showed that there is this uh, cutoff in the electron velocity distribution function in the sunward directed distribution function. Yes. Uh, I wonder if the data will be able to show something like that also in the Pater Solar Probe data. In principle, it should be, no? Uh, yeah, so in fact, uh, I already find some um, distribution functions which have a depletion um, around, so yeah, on the sunward side of the distribution function, but it's never really a cutoff because uh, at some energy you see appearing the halo also. So it's just um, in comparison to Maxwellian fit, there is a depletion also in particle solar probe data. And I plan to study this further also. Thank you, Laura. Okay. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Milan? Okay, so I will not uh, ask a question either because we, we already had many discussions with Laura. I just wanted to say that it has been a pleasure, of course, to work with you for, for these three years. Uh, I congratulate you, of course, for the thesis, for the presentation, and actually for all the work you have done. I mean, uh, you, you have to all to know that uh, Laura is, is really passionate about what she's doing and she is really a hard worker. And, and she has produced a lot actually during the, the PhD thesis. She has opened many doors. Uh, to my knowledge, it's one of the first PhD with Parker Solar Probe data. This is already an achievement uh, after two years of, uh, of, uh, of mission, basically. Um, she has also, as you have seen, she has worked on simulations. And really the interesting thing for me is the way she's uh, approaching both observation and simulation. She, 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 she knows where are the limits of both. Uh, she's uh, very cautious. And this is really, I think, important when you do science, not to be, uh, it's very important to be excited, but not overexcited. <laughs> because otherwise you can easily, you can easily go to, uh, to some wrong statements. So this is really, really good. I'm, uh, I think, to answer a little bit your question, really the story about the, the Strahl, okay, I will not review all what she has done, she has done a lot, but really the Strahl parallel temperature, what she shows, if you take the, 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 the temperature that she obtained from Parker Solar Probe or Helios, it's a little bit, it's constant, and it's a little bit more than what people who are looking at spectroscopic observation obtain. You know, it's, if, something like 120 EV or something like a, a little bit more than 10 to the 6 million. While if you remember maybe uh, some time ago that when you go, uh, when you look at the electron distribution uh, temperature in corona holes, it's closer to 0.9 uh, million and not above. So the, I think actually I believe personally in this increase which she observes in the big up simulation. And if you transfer that to the observations, it then matches even better with the temperature in the corona. And I think that in the future with the solar orbiter, 
Okay, you would have the chance to, to look uh, to be one of the first uh, after being one of the first to look at the Parker Solar Probe data. You are going to be one of the first to look at the, and I'm sure to do science with the solar orbiter electron instrument. Uh, I'm sure that, and this is also a message for Marco. We will be able to use this parallel temperature of the Strahl on solar orbiter as a proxy for the connectivity to the corona. You know that uh, solar orbiter is everything about connectivity between what you see on the spacecraft and remote sensing observations. For instance, there is one, one measurement on solar orbiter, which is the composition, which can give you a lot of information about the source of the solar wind in the corona. So people are very excited about the composition on, on solar orbiter. I'm sure that in the future, people will also be ex excited by the electron parallel temperature as a proxy for the electron temperature in the corona and in the core connectivity uh, models. So I really think it's a, it's a very good result. Congratulations. And thank you. And I, uh, that's it for me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vida. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one about the numerical simulation. Uh, did you modify it? Um, so, uh, the only thing, uh, so I modified the boundary conditions and where uh, this simulation box is, but it's not so simple because uh, the boundary conditions are dependent on each other. So um, it took a lot of time to even find good boundary conditions with gave, which gave stationary solutions. But I didn't uh, change the code itself. Mm -hmm. And I also have a question about the, the observations. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know exactly uh, uh, the dates for Helios, and uh, I know for Parker Solar Probe, but were the, the solar conditions similar for all these uh, uh, observations? Uh, I mean about the solar cycle. Uh, were the observations yeah. comparable? Um, half, let's say. So the Helios mission also started in uh, low activity, low solar activity, but this data is from six years or seven years. So it's really a, a mix between uh, the different parts of solar cycle. While for the Parker Solar Probe, it's really just uh, activity which is happening now. But is there any influence of the solar activity? Of course, there's an influence in Helios data. But um, so in this case, I just wanted to have uh, statistics over all the solar wind types and over all, um, all the data that I could get. And I haven't really looked at the change of the solar mm. activity, but it's a good thing to be careful. Mm. Maybe that can be a change of the value of the temperature, yes. parallel temperature. So that it should be higher. But then, it, yeah, again, it will be spread over all the distances. And I think so and the mission was starting in the um, less activity period, and then six years, so it's going to halfway of one solar cycle. So it's not like we're comparing uh, super active and low, act low active sun. And also about the orbit, uh, Helios was uh, uh, in the ecliptic. Mm -hmm. And so is the Parker Solar Probe. And so, so you never go at high latitudes? Uh, no, Par Parker Solar Probe also no, and Helios no. But As our yeah. yes. is the... Mm -hmm. Okay. It will be very interesting to see high latitudes again. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. So, uh, pour la délibération, on va devoir rester ici à cause de la visioconférence, donc on va être obligé de vous demander de sortir.